Okay, so let's get into some of the common writing flaws and the points of style. Uh, I think we had some comments earlier about people whose sentences are too long. I like to keep my sentences short and I strive for one idea per sentence. Most people think that a sentence should take something from the existing the previous paragraph, have something new, and then link it to another section. That's called a paragraph, not a sentence, right? So that's actually what you do in a paragraph. Uh, you know, and so a sentence should be one idea. And so I actually go through, and I'm, I still do it all the time. I have to go back and I dissect some of my sentences into three sentences, you know? Because some, sometimes I'll just sit down and just start writing a little bit of a vomit on the keyboard, but I'll go back and actually realize, well, that's actually a paragraph that I've written there, and that's what I meant uh, to do with it. So keep it really, really short, and I think, um, one of the main things that scientists are just terrible at is using jargon and buzzwords and acronyms. I strongly recommend never using an acronym unless it's absolutely critical. And just remember, you're really familiar with those acronyms. Your reviewer probably isn't. And probably has done two different things by the time they've re read your paper. So the fact that you define something on page one on page four, they don't remember what it says. And maybe they're not in a great space to, look. maybe they've got to like scroll on their iPhone to go find what it means, then they've got to go back. You can avoid that by just using the words, right? So I tend to, I tend to minimize acronyms, try not to use jargon, it's just impenetrable, and it's totally unhelpful. There's English for all of that, yeah. Um, and, and buzzwords are the worst, it really dates your piece. You know, you can definitely tell when something's written by the, by the sort of buzzwords they use. Try to avoid all of those. Make, make, make it a classic. Um, one of the important things is people often feel like they don't want to be repetitive, so they use lots of synonyms, but they don't explain that they're synonyms, so I never know that they're actually referring to the same thing. Right? So in the conservation literature, they might talk about a marine protected area, a marine reserve, a no-take closure, a fishery closure. There, there's several other terms. They're switching between them, but nobody knows whether they mean the same thing. And so they're trying to be helpful by not being repetitive, but it's completely unhelpful because nobody knows whether they're actually talking about two or three different things throughout the paper. So, I suggest always keeping your language consistent and choosing one term, particularly if it's a technical term, don't use a lot of synonyms for it. Or if you do, specifically say, I'm going to use these two terms interchangeably, right? So that people know that you mean the same thing. Um, use a consistent tense or voice throughout the paper. Um, I'm actually classic at doing this. I'll switch between past tense and uh, and, and, and present tense a bit, and uh, it, it actually gets a bit difficult. Um, but you should use a consistent voice or tense throughout the paper, and this drives reviewers crazy. Um, and also, mixing up sections of the paper is a really common writing flaw. People introduce results in the discussion because they thought it was really cool, but that's actually, that's probably like the biggest no-no in scientific writing. Results belong in the results. And if they're really important and you need them in the discussion, put them in the results because they're really important and you need them. Then you've actually, you're writing the wrong part of the paper. They go in the results section. The results go in the results. They never, ever, ever get introduced. Okay, and then there's some grammar which I'll briefly get into um, that has to do with that in which, as and because, and effect and effect. So as and because, these are synonyms, right? They mean the same thing, but as has multiple meanings. As can be temporal, as this was happening, right? As can also be comparative, as good as. As can also mean because, right? So this can make it ambiguous, right? As a reader, do you mean it's temporal? Do you mean it's comparative? Or do you mean it's because? If you mean because, use because, right? Because then it's, no, it's not ambiguous. I don't think, if you're saying because, I don't think you're meaning that it's temporal or comparative, right? 
that in which, okay, this is actually a really important one, which, surrounded by commas, if a group of words adds information, use that if it limits the set of things that you're talking about. So the books, which have red covers, are new, right? All the books are new, right? The books that have red covers are new, right? That means only the books with red covers are new, right? So these two words are kind of synonyms. They seem like they're a lot, but they actually mean completely different things for the sentence, right? They actually fundamentally change the meaning of it. So most of the time when I'm reading, people actually mean that, and they've written which, they actually mean that. So most of the time, like if you're just figuring out, I don't know which one to do, use that and you'll be right most of the time, unless you're trying to limit something, right? An affect and effect is one that people get really prickly about, and it's complicated, it's hard. I hate this one. But the majority, and the, yeah, it's not totally clear, but the majority of the time you use affect with an A as a verb, and effect with an E as a noun. So affect with an A means to influence. So the rain affected with an A Amy's hairdo. But effect with an E generally means as a result. So the rain had no effect or no result on Amy's hairdo. Right? So these are two things that reviewers will always pick up on. And some people are really prickly about it. So if you start off on the wrong thing, then they're just looking for problems the whole thing. So you're better off just getting these right. So just think about this for a moment. And then, you know, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that, that people get their backs up with. So some other points of style, use the metric system, even if it's an American journal. Uh, I suggest always, uh, I'm sort of a reformed American. I grew up there, but I've lived in, uh, in Australia for like 16 years, so I love the metric system. Uh, but I always think we should be using that in scientific publications. It's the standard unit. Um, uh, spell out numbers uh, that are starting sentences and that are below 10. Write numbers as numerals when they're above 10 or associated with measurements. So even if it's less than 10, if it's six kilometers per hour, make it a six, right? Okay, so a lot of us work in developing country fisheries and we often talk about whatever, how, how poor people are or how much they make off something. Use standard currencies for doing that, even though they may have gotten paid in ringgits. Make the translation so that somebody can understand what it means. Even if you provide the conversion early on, people don't remember that conversion. You're much better off doing the work for people so that they can understand the context of it. So I always use standard, for, and it doesn't have to be the US dollars, you know, you can use pounds or whatever it is, but make sure it's something that people are really, really familiar with so that they can understand what it actually means and not have to do, not have to read your paper with a calculator, right? Um, and really important to check your references and citations. Probably when I send stuff out to review, probably one in eight reviewers goes through every single reference and checks. And if there's missing things, those reviewers tend to be really, really pissy. They tend to be really upset, and that's reflected in the review. So I think their idea is, if you're careless about this, what else are you careless about? If you're careless about the most simple thing, right? there's programs that do this for you. There's zero excuse to not have your references correct. You know, whatever, and they're all free, right? So you can just go on, download them, tell them what journal, it's gonna do it in the right format, and it's gonna have all of them in there. The only thing I'll say with that is I don't, I don't use those programs because I use Mac and I was using EndNote, and when you do track changes with multiple authors, in EndNote on a Mac, it crashes all the time. So I actually now just have my research assistant do it at the end, but I don't know if Mendeley or the other ones are, are as bad. Is it better? Okay, yeah, because it was just leading to meltdowns, and uh, yeah, it was not, it was not, so I just gave up for a little while. But anyway, there's these programs out there, and there's no reason to be careless about things. Like, again, you know, if you're sloppy about the little things, 
how, why would they think you're good about the big things, right? You're going to be sloppy about that too. Okay, so let's get into um, what's in a paper. And um, again, you know, this gets right back to your point. Disciplines and journal styles vary, right? And so the abstract introduction, um, methods, result, and discussion is most common in sort of, you know, science and conservation. And it, it, it's easy to understand uh, what was done and to replicate it, and that's why. You know, I guess in, in a lot of the social sciences, particularly things like anthropology, the purpose isn't replication, right? Because you're embedded in the community, no one's going to replicate what you've done, and that's not the purpose of it. So the, the reasons for writing in a different style are really clear because the whole purpose of the research is very, very different, you know, and it's not about replication and replicability and, uh, and building that. So that may get at why these different styles are done. Again, I'm mostly going to be talking about this sort of, uh, this sort of style. But some, usually the sort of prestigious journals, uh, integrate the results in the discussion and they put the methods at the end to make it more punchy. It's actually kind of hard to write that way. Um, I've had a little bit of success at it, not as much as I'd like uh, publishing those top journals, but um, it, it's hard. They're doing it because they want a narrative. Uh, <laughs> Most journals have a style guide. Follow that style guide. It's really important, and I'll, I'll describe what those, uh, those style guides are. 